I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about this. It's a subject that I care about a great deal. As you see, I'm not the only one. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, actually, there's at least one former Brandeis undergraduate in the audience. Yahar, where are you? There you are. Yeah, she will tell you uh, from having taken courses that uh, I like dialogues better than monologues. That's a fair statement, isn't it? And so I'm happy to have you interrupt me in the middle okay, with questions as we go along. I'll also take some at the end. Don't hesitate. All right. Now, a little background. About 15 years ago, the National Academy of Sciences commissioned a study on the postdoctoral experience in the United States. And as studies go, it issued its report a couple of years later, and the recommendations were put out for the community to do something about. It had quite a lot of recommendations, because it thought that the experience for postdocs in the US wasn't everything it should be. And certainly was not the same as the experience when people like me were postdocs thousands of years ago. <laughs> Back in the days when the giant thesaurus roamed the earth. <laughs> OK, so uh, 10 years after that, four years ago, the academy decided to do something revolutionary. It decided to actually see if any of those implementations had done anything. And so it wanted to do a follow-up study. And that was unusual for two reasons. First of all, you almost never do follow-up studies of the government. And second, this was the first time that all three of the national academies, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, which used to be called the Institute of Medicine, and the National Academy of Engineering, ever worked together on a study in the history of the country. So that gives you some idea how important they thought this issue was. And as a further indication of how important they thought this issue was, they asked me to chair the committee. <laughs> I wasn't being humorous. <laughs> no, seriously, Ralph Ciceroni, the head of the National Academy of Sciences, actually knew me well enough to know that I wasn't going to undertake something like this unless I was given completely free reign to say whatever it was I thought the committee needed to say, and to then get out there and preach to the public about how important it was. And so the fact that he would let a notorious boat rocker like myself rock a few boats indicates how important they thought things were. Because normally you want to keep me about as far from a committee as you possibly can. <laughs> Well, we were supposed to take two years to do the report, and it took four. I'll explain why in a moment. But the report did come out, and this is it. All right, it has the sexy title, The Postdoctoral Experience Revisited. You'll see in a moment I wanted to call it something else. It is available from the National Academy Press online, and it's easy to find. And for those of you who haven't read it, let me simply say that you don't have to waste your time doing so, because I'm going to basically take you through most of its major conclusions. But it may be worth keeping uh, as a point of reference. Why did it take us four years? We had a good committee. It wasn't because the committee was bad. We had labor economists. We had scientists from engineering. We had scientists from biology, chemistry, physics. We had people from national labs. We had people from industry. We had people from the private sector. We had every possible combination you could ask for. We had two Nobel laureates on the committee, for God's sakes, and they actually all did the work. That wasn't why. We're scientists. So when we decided to do this study, the first thing we wanted to do was to acquire data not to deal with anecdotes about postdoctoral experience, but to really find out what was going on in the world. And so we st spent the first month or two basically getting in touch with hundreds, literally, of institutions in the United States and elsewhere. And we started by asking one very simple question. How many postdocs do you have? How are they supported? Where do they come from? What happens to them when they finish? Do you know how many institutions could answer any part of that question? Two. Do 
Do you know how many institutions could tell us within a factor of two how many postdocs they had? Almost none. All right? And we suddenly realized this wasn't going to be a two-year study. This was going to be a four-year study because we were going to have to try to get data that in many cases literally didn't exist. And now you know why I wanted to call this report <laughs> that, by the way, is Claude Rains under there. In case you've never seen the movie, it's a pretty good one. But uh, you and I remember this movie. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, okay. You know, postdocs really are invisible in most of their institutions. Now, why is that true? It took us quite a while to, to sort of answer that question. But eventually it became clear. There are a bunch of different reasons. One is, of course, that postdocs are called many different things at any institution. It isn't just that institution A calls a postdoc one thing and institution B calls a postdoc something else. No, it's that institution A has 12 different names for postdocs. Right? They're postdoctoral fellows, they're postdoctoral research associates, they're research associates, they're research assistants. It's a long, complex list. No wonder they can't count them. As far as knowing how they're supported, well, I mean, good luck. Some are self-supported, some are paid off grants, some are paid partly off grants and partly by self-support, some are paid for by non-federal funds, some are paid for by industry. Some are paid for out of institutional funds. I know that's hard to believe here, but it's true. <laughs> and, you know, it gets insane, right, very quickly. As far as knowing whether they came from the U.S. or outside the U.S., oh, good luck with that. In many cases, lots of people don't want you to know. And finally, as far as what happens to them when they're done, the elementary aspect of outcomes. Where do, what kind of jobs do they get? How long do they stay in those jobs? Are they happy when they go there? Are they happy after five, ten years? All right. We couldn't get that from any place. And it became very clear that the reason we couldn't get that from any place is that no place cared. Now, I don't have to tell you that when it comes to graduate students, the situation is considerably different. And I believe that the reason for that can be understood if you simply think about what we call you. So how many people in this room are postdocs? How many people in this room are graduate students? OK, everybody in this graduate in this room who is not a graduate student should have raised their hand the first time, including me. Because, of course, postdoc is not a category of job. Postdoc is a time unit. <laughs> I am post my doc. I am a lot more post my doc than you are, but I am still post doc. It is the only academic category that has nothing in it about what it's supposed to be doing. If you're a graduate student, you're supposed to be a student. If you're a technician, or let's call you a research assistant, you're supposed to be assisting research. If you are a junior faculty member, say an assistant professor, you are supposed to be learning how to be a professor. If you are a postdoc, you are a time interval. <laughs> And may I point out to you that that time interval has no time limit. <laughs> Not only will you still be a postdoc theoretically at my age, in some institutions you could well be a real postdoc <laughs> at my age. Okay. Is it any wonder that places don't want you to know what the outcomes are? So that's what we were up against. Well, we did our best. And if you read the report, we've got an entire chapter in which we lay out the data we were able to collect. I got to tell you, it wasn't the data we were hoping to be able to collect. 
So one of the first take-home messages from this study, and one of the take-home messages that I try to give every place I do a talk like this, and I've done almost 30 of them now, is you have a responsibility as an institution to collect and make publicly available the kind of data I'm talking about. If you don't know how many postdocs you have, and I think Sinai is one of the places that knows a bit better that than many others, then you should count them. You should find out how they're being supported. You should find out where they come from. And you should find out what happens to them when you are through with them. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job. Now, ultimately, you should simply put these data online and make them available. But there also should be a national collection of such data so we can look at global trends and patterns among institutions. And the place for that should be the National Science Foundation, and we are trying to make that happen. But of course, they can't collect the data if there are no data to collect. So the onus is still on institutions to do the collecting. And I'm hoping that every time I give this talk, the least that can happen is that the institution decides that maybe it's time it did that. Okay. So as I said, a postdoc is the only position in all of science that does not have spelled out in the title of that position the obligations of the person who has that position and the reciprocal obligation of the place that's employing. If you are a graduate student, your job is to be a student, which means our job is to teach you. Okay, And that at least is clear. So why should we care what happens to postdocs if we don't even agree on what we're supposed to do with them? And like I said, it's been very hard to establish this on a countrywide basis because so many institutions don't take any data at all. Uh, and yet, the growth of postdocs in this country has been exponential. Okay? These are PhD recipients from US colleges and universities. You see it's been growing, but it's had periods where it's been growing flat. It's had other periods where it's been declining. These are periods of declining federal funding. This is just where the financial crisis hit. You'd see this is still a downturn. It's just starting to turn up now. But the blue line, that's the number of postdocs. You'll notice that not only is that climbing much more steeply, you'll notice it is essentially insensitive to any kind of underlying economic condition. Here. Yes. So in order, well, of course, these aren't our data. So the answer is these particular data right, were determined by establishing who at a given research institution, and I think there were about 100 surveyed to get these data, and then extrapolations were made, who at a, a given research institution was not employed as a tenure track faculty member or a staff scientist and had beyond a PhD degree. Okay, so it was an attempt to make it as broad as possible, Allison. But you know what? I, I would say these are soft numbers, and, and probably really very soft. And still, I mean, you know, we're looking at 65,000, maybe. <laughs> okay, you know, that's a good-sized community there. All right. So I like the way Keith Yamamoto puts it. There's also cognitive dissonance going on here, right? And it's the following. From the point of view of the faculty, a postdoc is an individual who manages their lab, OK, and frees them to do the things they're supposed to do, which is to do supervised research, teach, obtain funding, and possibly you know, go learn how to do 106 push-ups, whatever you want to do. OK. The postdoc naively believes they're supposed to be getting advanced training in research and being mentored towards a career. Okay? 
you will notice there are almost no word overlap between these two <laughs> definitions, much less an overlap in the definition itself. Okay. If this were really the case, then we'd be worried. It's not quite this extreme. Keith is obviously using this just to make a point. But you know what? It's not all that different from this either in many cases. And that's a problem. So one of the first things we tried to do in this report was to make clear what we thought a postdoc should be about. We think a postdoc is ideally much more like what the postdoc thinks the postdoc should be about. We think that ideally the postdoc should be a period of mentored training in advanced research. And this just doesn't mean some technique. This means really learning how to conceive projects, think about what the data means, develop projects, obtain funding for projects, all of those things that advanced training in research involves. But note the key words in research. We also believe that the postdoc is not designed as a holding pattern for people who can't think what they're supposed to do with their lives. It is for people who know they want to do research and need more training in doing it. If you as faculty want someone to do this, sorry, to do this, well, those people used to exist. Some of us are old enough to remember this. They were called staff scientists, and they were paid for partly out of grants, but more commonly, believe it or not, institutions actually provided for the salary for such people. In many cases, they ran not just research groups, but entire technical support laboratories, or in some cases, collections of research groups. And they were highly valued and valuable individuals who often did research of their own as well, but who were not tenure-track faculty members. What they weren't was postdoc. Now, believe it or not, this explosive growth in postdocs is even occurring in fields where we would have bet it couldn't possibly be occurring, like computer science, right? I mean, everybody knows if you want to get a job these days, all you got to do is major in computer science. You get a job out of bachelor's degree, for Christ's sake. But and yet, look at this. It's staggering, OK? Here are the number of postdocs in computer science. This is kind of scary. I could show you a similar curve for engineering, where much like in computer science, prior to about 2005, there was absolutely nothing in the way of postdocs. You just didn't do it. And now, like this. Amazing. OK. What's driving this? Well, my father was an economist. And he would have said, that what's driving this is a series of what he would have called perverse incentives. Namely, there are actual positive feedbacks being built into the system that encourage the explosive growth of postdocs without anybody ever sitting down and saying, wait a minute, is this a good idea? All right. One of them, of course, is the extreme decline in NIH success rate that's been occurring since about the time I was an undergraduate. Believe it or not, back in those days, the average success rate for an NIH study section was approaching 50%. No, this is not a typo. <laughs> okay? My first faculty position came in 1974 with a 40% success rate. By the way, my first grant was turned down anyway. <laughs> I moved to MIT in 1978. Okay. 30% success rate. I did OK. I moved to Brandeis in 1990. We were still damn close to a 30% success rate. Right around here, OK, is the NIH budget doubling. You will notice the success rate does not increase particularly. OK? In fact, by the way, neither did the number of people receiving grants. 
if you compare before the doubling to after the doubling, the increase in the number of people receiving grants was less than 2%. Which means big labs got bigger, rich labs got richer, but no more people tended to get funded. And now, of course, something absolutely horrible has been going on, namely the success rate has been dropping like a stone, and this particular graph ended in 2010. Now this number, of course, is 10% or lower in almost every institute. And that's kind of scary as heck. And, of course, when people run scared, they make decisions based out of fear. One decision is, I've got to publish a ton of papers in order to get a grant. I've got to get a lot of preliminary data and in order to get my grant renewed, which is actually even harder in many cases than getting the first grant. The only way to publish a ton of papers is I've got to have a big lab with a lot of people who are really cranking out research. And of course, graduate students don't crank out research. Uh, basically, they don't work at all. <laughs> so I've got to get people who I think will work. There were a few graduate students here, right? That wasn't wasted. Good. OK. Uh, but you know, I need postdocs. I need people specialized. I need people who know how to do this type of experiment because I just sent my manuscript off to sell, and the reviewers came back and said, that's great, but you've got to do it in C. elegance. Okay? And you sit there thinking, wait a minute, I've never worked in C. elegance. And the reviewers say, we don't care. Do it in C. elegance anyway. So now I've got to hire a postdoc who's an expert on C. elegance, and, and so it goes. Right? So the system is forcing people to have larger labs with more experienced people in them to keep them longer, to do longer experiments, because the doubling time of C. elegans is longer than that of yeast, <laughs> which is what I work in. And uh, there's no breaking of this trend. Right? It just continues to drive labs to get bigger. And paradoxically, the harder it is to get funding for labs, the bigger the labs get. This is what I mean by a perverse incentive. But this is clearly what's driving the system. Okay? And increasingly, people feel you have to publish in boutique journals in order to survive. I can't tell you the number of times that I have sat in a room uh, reviewing a postdoctoral candidate or a grant or whatever, maybe doing a tenure review, and had one of the other members of the committee say, well, so-and-so published two papers in science and one paper in nature. And I will say in my best innocent-sounding voice, and some of you who know me will know that when I sound innocent, it's when you should really worry. <laughs> I will uh, say, uh, can you uh, tell me what's uh, in those papers? <laughs> and of course, they haven't read them. They're using where they publish as a proxy for what they publish. Well, if we don't stop doing stuff like that, this trend is just going to get worse. All right. And of course, the bulk of postdocs are supported by research grants. And that means the number of postdocs is set by two things. One, whether you can get a grant. But two, and this is actually much more important, how little you can get away with paying a postdoc because of whatever the NIH minimum postdoctoral salary is. When it comes to supporting science, the NIH is the 500-pound gorilla. And even in fields as disparate as physics, they look to the NIH minimum postdoctoral salary as a rough guideline for what their floor should be. If that floor is way below what the market should be for someone with that kind of skill set, then people can hire lots more postdocs. So think about what that means. That means this is not a labor market at all. In a labor market, roughly over time, supply and demand should equalize. And if the available jobs for postdocs in academia or whatnot goes down, you'd expect there to be a decrease in the number of postdocs. And of course, we know that the number of academic jobs has gone down, and yet the postdoctoral population has increased exponentially. That is because the market is not being driven by market forces. 
the market is being driven by the minimum NIH postdoctoral stipend. It is not a labor market in the true sense of the word. And my father was a labor economist, so I actually know a little about what I speak here. And as I said, NIH is the 500-pound gorilla. There is the life sciences. These are the percent of graduates entering postdoctoral positions. You can see that in the life sciences, 70% of PhDs go into postdoctoral positions, whereas in the physical sciences, it's closer to 50%. In engineering, it's still gone up, as I told you. Now it's approaching 40%. And by God, even the humanities, where it used to be zero, is now approaching 20%. So we don't have a true labor market. We've never had a true labor market. This is where people go, OK? So these are tenure track positions. This is what's happened to them since 1973. All right? And I've shown you what's happened to the postdoc. So in fact, if you are a postdoc and you are interested in an academic job statistically, you have a less than 30% chance of ending up in one five years after you're finished. And somebody should have told you that when you were a graduate student. <laughs> because how can you make intelligent career choices without knowing things like that? Where do you go after your PhD? Well, academic employment is here for US citizens and permanent residents. But academic employment, of course, is including postdocs. So all of this is postdocs plus other non-postdoc academic employment. All right? This is industry, and this is other. I'm not sure what other means, but I think it may have a lot to do with the fast food industry. <laughs> And you can see that for people who were not born in the United States, as far as we could tell, the numbers are even more striking. OK? 45% become postdocs when they finish their PhD. It's just, these are, this has become an automatic reaction. The postdoc is the default for most people with a PhD in a STEM subject. Now the question is, should it be? I want to argue to you that the answer is overwhelmingly no. It's a terrible idea for the postdoc to be the default. Why do I say that? I say that for the following reason. When we did this particular report, I spent a lot of time talking to people who do things that aren't academic science. I spent time talking to patent attorneys. I spent time talking to policymakers in Washington. I spent time talking to TV journalists print journalists, people doing venture capital, people in the finance industry, people in the pharmaceutical industry, and so forth. I asked them all the same set of questions. Do you have a PhD? Most of them do. Was the PhD a useful thing for you in your present job? Most of them said yes. I then asked them, did you do a postdoc? Most of them said yes. Was the postdoc a useful thing for you to have done in your present job? Most of them said no. In fact, many of them didn't just say no. They said specifically, I wasted five years of my life as a postdoc. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing now. And if I'd gotten right from my PhD and gone into business school, law school, journalism school, internship in Washington, whatever else I might have done, I'd be five years ahead on my income from where I am now because I spent five years wasting my time doing advanced training in research. And research has nothing to do with my job. And what's scary to me is when I ask them how many of them pretty much knew all along that they were likely not to go into academic research. A surprising number of them said they knew that. But they still did a postdoc. Because nobody ever told them 
you don't want to do this. Here's what you should do. And it costs them. My God, does it cost them. OK? Here are people five years after receiving their PhD and what they earn. OK? These are people who are postdocs. You know what they earn. These are people who went into other positions right after their postdocs. Look at some of these numbers. Will you eventually catch up? Not really. <laughs> no. OK? And as I said, as to what you end up doing, 23% of you will end up in industry, in, in academic positions. And tw another 20% will end up in some non-tenured academic research or teaching position, maybe as adjunct faculty, who knows, all kinds of things, right? 18% of you will do industrial research. That's a surprisingly low number, isn't it? I'd have thought it would be higher, but it's not. And then you see the rest. Let's try not to pay too much attention to this. <laughs> By the way, I don't have a problem here. I'm married to the dean of Cornell Medical School. <laughs> that is a career opportunity that they don't tell you about. <laughs> For some of us, it exists. OK. Of course, in the long run, as John Maynard Keynes remarked, we're all dead. But in general, people who start out in academic tenure track positions tend not to stay there as often as you might think. So of the number who actually start, by the five years since their PhD, 40% of them have gone. And by the time you look 10, 11, 20 years out, the number's dropped even further. So it's, it's pretty amazing, actually. So what do we conclude from this? Here's what we conclude from this. First, I believe we've got to stop calling you just postdocs. I believe, I mean, I, I know what we call you in the lab. That's different. We can't repeat that in public. But <laughs> institutionally, we need to put a word with that word to indicate your responsibilities and our responsibilities. So we thought a reasonable thing would be to call you a postdoc researcher to indicate that you should be doing research and we should be making it easier for you to learn to do research. I actually preferred postdoctoral research trainee, but uh, the committee voted me down on that one. But it just shouldn't be postdoc. Okay, bad idea. All right. And we should make clear that if you are a postdoc, your time period to be one should be temporary, all right? and it should be mentored, and it should be for advanced training in research, not as a way to keep you off the streets. All right. Now, the obvious conclusion from this is that maybe we shouldn't be having as many people with PhDs in the sciences, right? Wrong. That is, in fact, the conclusion I do not wish you to take away because it is not true. Yes, it is true that there has been a rapid growth of PhDs in a variety of scientific subjects, though not nearly so much in some as in others. The life sciences and others have gone up much faster. But I don't think there's too many. Because I believe a PhD in a science, technology, or engineering, or mathematics related subject is fabulous preparation for 100 different careers. Law, business, government, you name it. All right? It teaches you how to look at data and seriously think about what it means. It teaches you how to think ahead, plan, design things, understand, troubleshoot. There are so many things about being a PhD that's good. And that, by the way, when I went around and talked to various employers in non-academic sectors, they all said the same thing. We'd love more PhDs in the sciences. Please send us more PhDs in the sciences. We don't see them. They go do postdocs. <laughs> okay. So no, we're not training too many science PhDs. In a world that is becoming increasingly more technological, I don't think we can train too many PhDs. You had your hand up. 
OK, hold on one second. My hearing aid battery just went out. So I'm going to take it out. It'll make it a little easier for me to hear you, and I'll walk over here. Go ahead. What stands in the way of putting in a more structured system similar to medical school, to residency, to a physician? So the question is, what stands in the way of putting together a more structured system, somewhat more like the old apprenticeship system, right? Where what you have as a physician, right? You go to medical school, you become an intern and resident, and so forth. And it has a defined period. Right, it has a defined period. Okay? You want to know what stands in the way? Look around the room at everybody about twice as old as you are. <laughs> okay? Because what stands in the way is mostly the hidebound traditionalists who tend to run institutions. And I'm not obviously referring to anybody in particular here. Right? If I were referring to anybody in particular here, that would be an inappropriate thing to do. Right. But uh, it is the problem. Okay? There's nothing that stands in the way in terms of it being a sensible idea. There's nothing that stands in the way of it being illegal or immoral or unethical to implement. What stands in the way is tradition and people's reluctance to change. OK, so as I said, no, there are not too many graduate students. The problem is decisions about where those PhD awardees go are being made way too late. They're making those decisions three years, four years into their postdoc. They should be making those decisions at the beginning of their PhD, a year or two into their PhD. The pipeline is wrong. Okay, it branches at the wrong place. That's the major problem. Okay, and here's evidence that I'm right. Okay, these are unemployment rates of scientists and engineers by level of their degree. And if you have a PhD, your chance of being unemployed even 35 years out since your degree is much lower than if you have a lower degree. It is a good thing to have a PhD in the sciences and engineering. It does protect you. Okay? You just have to go into the right field with it. You have to do something that you are able to do and that you enjoy doing and that you want to do. Not that you think you're supposed to do or that your faculty advisor thinks you're supposed to do or that your parents think you're supposed to do. Okay? You have one life to live, unless you know something the rest of us don't, <laughs> or unless you're a Buddhist. <laughs> now, I happen to be a Buddhist, so I believe I'm going to be reincarnated as a higher, at a higher plane of existence. I would like to come back as my dogs, but unfortunately, <laughs> I haven't lived a good enough life to do that. So it'll probably be a cat or something, God knows <laughs> what. But, but unless you're, unless you're in that particular frame of mind, this is the only shot you get. Live your own goddamn life, not somebody else's idea of what it should be. All right. I can't guarantee if you do that, you'll be successful. But I guarantee you, if you don't do that, you're unlikely to be happy. And happiness is underrated. <laughs> All right. I believe that there should be a strict limit on the time you can spend as a postdoc, period. Okay? We settled on five years. Some of us wanted four. Some of us wanted six. We settled on five. I think it's about right. We don't think this should be a straitjacket. There may be medical reasons, child care reasons. There may be a number of reasons why this should be elastic, and we'd be fine with that. But it should be clear to everybody from day one that this is a temporary arrangement. So what I'm saying, in essence, if you want it summed up as a diagram, is simply this. This is the way things work now. Okay? And the sorting takes place when you're a postdoc. And that's stupid for a lot of reasons. In many people's cases, it's a huge waste of time. Plus, it breeds a system in which there's huge disappointment. Because people go into postdocs with an expectation of a career outcome that is not only numerically unrealistic, but it's probably unrealistic for them. 
And so the experience and information they need that will allow them to make a better choice and have a much less stressful, much less disappointing experience, that needs to take place way before they become postdocs. In other words, what we want, all right, and by the way, you'll notice that increasingly this is happening, all right, where somebody does a postdoc, then they think, oh, I better do another postdoc, all right, because I didn't get the outcome I wanted. What we want is this. The sorting has to take place here. Career options have to be delivered at the graduate student level. Now, if there are career programs in place where you have internships available and you have opportunities to meet people with other careers and talk to them about their life and what they need to get that far and so forth, this should not be closed to postdocs by any means. But it should be aimed at graduate students and all graduate students need to do that. The outcome, if this happens, is we have people who have information. And when you have information, you are empowered to take more charge of your own life. Now, this doesn't solve all the problems of people who have gone on and do postdocs. And some of those problems are not career related. Some of those problems have to do with the fact that they're too much at the mercy of an individual faculty member and that institutions don't provide them with ombuds people or a committee like graduate students have of other faculty who can intercede and take an interest in them. Now, I happen to believe, and we're putting this in place at Wild Cornell, that all postdocs should have a committee, just like graduate students have one, of two or three faculty members, not their mentor not their principal investigator. That committee only has to meet once a year, maybe, but, or once every six months. But the point is, they have it. There is somebody else at that institution who gives a bleep and who is willing to do something for them. And I think we have to implement that everywhere. All right? It's more work for people like us? Yeah. It also happens to be work we're supposed to do. So if this works, will it have the effect of improving training? I think it will. Will it have the effect of giving postdocs a better career option? I think it will. Okay, But maybe it would also reestablish a bit of the joy of being a postdoc. Most of us, when we were postdocs, that was the best time of our life. We had relatively few responsibilities, a lot of research freedom. It was enormous fun. I don't think a lot of people who are postdocs have that these days. And that really makes me feel bad, because I think you deserve to have that. And it's sad that you don't. But I'm not sure it would lead to the right balance of the number of postdocs for the number of academic jobs, because we still don't have a labor market that works like a labor market. So a recommendation we put in was to increase the minimum NIH stipend up over $50,000. I wanted 75. OK? And I was right to want 75. Because what that would do would be to force labs to get a little smaller and to make better decisions about who deserves to be a postdoc. Right now, believe it or not, and we actually have numbers in the report to back this up, it's easier to get a postdoc at a good institution than it is to be a graduate student at a good institution. That's not supposed to work that way. The further you go up the ladder, the harder it should be. Okay, So we need to change that. And increasing the NIH postdoctoral stipend minimum to over 50 would help. But I wanted 75, and I was right. The rest of the committee was wrong. Okay. That would cause a lot of labs to shrink by 40%, 30 40%. I'll get to you in a second. Now, was that a popular suggestion? No. There were a lot of Christmas cards I didn't get that year. <laughs> but it's just, well, I hate answering Christmas cards anyway. What's your question? But remember, since my hearing aid went out, you're going to have to yell. What if instead of increasing the postdoc salary, you increase the salary of assistant professor so that we are more motivated towards that direction? 
So what if instead of increasing the postdoctoral salary, we increase the salary of assistant professors so that more people are motivated to reach that level? I'd be willing to consider that argument if it weren't for the fact, that, and we actually did look at this, that assistant professors' salaries have risen rather sharply in the last 20 years and look like they're going to continue to do so. So I'm not sure it's as necessary, but I think the increasing of the postdoctoral stipend is necessary because that labor market is artificially distorted by the NIH. Now, a common pushback I get is you reduce the size of labs and the number of postdocs and productivity is going to go down. You know what? I think that's a load of crud. If I were honest with myself, I would say that over the course of my career, if my lab had been 30, 40% smaller, I probably would have produced about the same number of good papers, probably fewer total papers, but probably about the same number of papers I would be proud of. And I would have trained certainly exactly as many people that I think I did a good job of training, and maybe more, because I would have had more time to spend with the people I did have. I don't think my lab, if you were honest with yourself, I don't think my lab needed to be as big as it was. And I'm not sure anybody's lab really does. But if we increase the postdoctoral salary to stipend to $75,000 a year, and people can find the grant money to have the same number of postdocs, more power to them. Okay. But I suspect that in the community as a whole, the number of postdocs would drop. And I'll bet you the productivity of science wouldn't suffer much, if anything, at all. I'd love to do the experiment, but I couldn't get that recommendation in. Yeah? So uh, you made me re-look at some data that we always look at when we look at what happens to women in STEM fields. Yeah. And we see a funnel. And so that women, in fact, do not often continue after their PhD. The pipeline is leaky for women, yes. and it leaks late, relatively surprising places. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. We assume that it's stressful because they're not following the traditional path. Oh, no, quite the contrary. I think you're quite right. Uh, first of all, it is generally true that women are more practical than men anyway. Okay. And second, I think you could make the argument that because there are often cold-blooded necessities that drive them to be that practical, they've made, in fact, more informed decisions. That wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. I think that might well be true. Okay? But it still troubles me that the pipeline leaks where it does for women. And there are simple ways to fix that. Okay? This seminar was at 4 o'clock. Okay? Should have been at noon. All right? Research seminars are at 4 or 5 o'clock. They should be at 11 o'clock or noon. All right? We go out to dinner with faculty who visit from other institutions, and it's the faculty who take them. No, it should be the graduate students who take them to dinner. Faculty can go to lunch with them. Why don't we structure some of the things we do as an institution to make them a bit more family friendly? Speaking as a visitor, somebody who goes around to a lot of other institutions, I love it when I give a morning talk. Then, all during those meetings with faculty during the rest of the day, we got something to talk about. It, it's better for everybody. Okay? Yet we don't do that. That's something any institution could do tomorrow to improve the situation for women. Right? Because women, you know, rightly or wrongly, have most of the child care responsibilities to deal with themselves. Don't care how supportive your partner is, I know that. All right? So. Yeah, I don't see why we can't make simple changes like that. It would sure as hell help. Something we're trying to do at Weill Cornell, by the way. Yeah. But then, of course, our dean is a woman. Yeah. You, you've spoken a lot about the supply. I'm sorry? You've spoken a lot about the supply part of the I've spoken a lot about the supply part. But what about the demand part? So the number of faculty positions and how that's right. declined. And then also considering the boom-bust cycles of NIH funding. Right. 
Yeah, the boom bust cycles of NIH funding. And what that does to you know certain uh, departments build you know right. science buildings and then they're filled and then they're vacated and then there's well medical schools in particular are always building new buildings because of course that's how they, they get donors, grateful patients, to put their money on buildings. But then they got to fill the buildings. Once they fill the buildings, those labs have got to hire people, and so it goes. Yeah, the demand side is a huge problem. Okay, and. The only way I can think of to fix that, besides what I would normally do, which would be involving the use of dynamite and cattle prods, <laughs> would be to, I think, change completely the way the NIH is supported by Congress. So there's a move underfoot to double the NIH budget again. All right? One definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting a different outcome. I have no interest in another doubling of the NIH budget. What I would love to see is written into Congress predictable, steady, yearly increases in the NIH budget. No boom-bust cycles, just a very slow, steady growth. And if you figure that scientific inflation typically is 2 or 3% higher than normal inflation, I would say right now, if we set that target at 5 or 6% increase per year, every year, forever, and no growth over and above that, all right, but no decrease either, we'd be in much better shape and we'd be a long way closer to fixing your demand issue because institutions and individuals could make longer term sensible plans. All right? And when I'm not trying to do the 50 million other things I got to do, I am occasionally in Washington lobbying for exactly this. All right. I don't know whether there's much of a chance for it, but it would be the right thing to do. I'm just about done. Okay. For graduate students, we need to train them broadly in science. Scientific literacy is important. They need math and statistical and computational skills. Boy, do they need statistical skills. It's incredible how few people in this country, especially science journalists, really understand statistics. And not enough doctors do either. Okay? And for postdocs, that's advanced training in research, which means if they're going to go on in research, we ought to start teaching them something about how research is managed, not just how to do experiments in the lab. I took all the wrong courses in school. I took useless stuff. I took math, physics, chemistry, biology. It's been a complete waste of time. Because 90% of what I learned, of course, was wrong. You know what I should have taken? Accounting would have been helpful. <laughs> Abnormal psychology, that would have been really helpful. <laughs> Sociology, anthropology, economics, all right? It would have been a lot more helpful than the crap I took. OK. Hopefully, if we do all this, we'll be in a better place culturally. We need people like you to advocate for this. But we need the administrators in this room, and I'm glad to see there are some, to really put these sorts of reforms in place. Because although the best ideas come from the bottom up, culture comes from the top down. And only with the right kind of leadership can the culture of science change. I'm hoping it can. OK? I'm hoping that it will. I think I'll stop here. Thanks.